Well, good morning. It is great to be with you this morning. What an incredible week we are headed into. Easter week, the cornerstone, uh, yes, pun intended, uh, of our Christian faith, right? This is an incredible week. Uh, today we're going to watch Jesus ride into Jerusalem in a donkey and, and unpack how significant that moment was. But then the rest of the week we're going to march towards the cross and, and what happens on Friday changed the world, but what happens next Easter Sunday changed everything forever. And there should be no week in the Christian calendar and in the year that we get more excited about as believers than this week. Because everything about it celebrates the good news of the gospel. Well, a, a quick sort of side family note. It is so exciting to see people serving in their giftings. Bob Vanvas has, has served for nearly a decade leading our hospitality team. Roberta Meggs is now stepping into that role. And with her gifting, she's going to continue to help us welcome visitors well. This week, our family closed on our house and, and moved in, and so it was one of those weeks where you're up till midnight painting, and you're drive, pulling into town at 2 a.m. with a 26-foot trailer full of your stuff. And over a dozen of our Cornerstone family wrapped their arms around us and painted with us until midnight, or got there at 8 a.m. and painted rooms for us and, and helped us unload. It's just a beautiful thing when the church of God serves one another. And so I want to encourage you, this morning there are somewhere between 30 and 40 people serving across this campus to make what happens here possible. If you're not plugged in in an area of the giftings that God's given you, I want to invite you to do that. We are a better place when you serve in the way that God's made you to serve. So if you're curious where that might be, come grab me, grab your home team leader and elder, and we want to get you plugged in in those ways. Well, let's turn to John 12 this morning. That's where we're going to be. In fact, we're going to kind of walk through John this week in many different ways, and I'll tell you more about that in a second. But that last song we just sang, Then came the morning, and the lion roared. There is something exciting about Easter that has changed everything we know. What an incredible time to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. But before we get to Jesus' death, we are going to talk about his marching in to Jerusalem. Not actually marching, riding a donkey into Jerusalem today. In order to kind of frame the context of that, I want us to consider how do we typically celebrate the arrival of a king? I want to give you at least one story I came across from Kent Hughes in his commentary this week. He tells the story of his imperial majesty, King Bacosa I of the Central African Empire, in December of 1977, King Bacasa uh, held his coronation ceremony. So let me tell you a little bit about it. The price tag for this one event, designed and choreographed by French designer Olivier Bryce, was $25 million. At 10.10 10 a.m. that morning, the blare of trumpets and the roll of drums announced the approach of His Majesty. The procession began with eight of Bacasa's 29 official children parading down the royal carpet to their seats. They were followed by Jean Bedel Bacasa II, uh, Bacasa's young son, heir to the throne, dressed in a white admiral's uniform with gold braids. He was seated on a red pillow to the left of the throne. Well, Catherine, the favorite of Bacasa's nine wives, was wearing a $73,000 gown made by Lanvin of Paris, strewn with pearls she had picked out herself. The emperor then arrived in a gold, eagle-bedecked imperial coach drawn by six matched Anglo-Norman horses. He wore a 32-pound robe decorated with 785,000 strewn pearls and golden embroidery. On his brow, he wore a gold crown of laurel wreaths like those worn by the Roman consuls of old, a symbol of the favor of the gods. As the sacred march came to a conclusion, Bocasa, as we see in this picture, seated himself in his $2.5 million eagle throne, took his golden laurel wreath off, and as Napoleon 173 years before had done, took this $2.5 million crown, which was topped with an 80-carat diamond, and placed it on his son's head. Because his reign was not nearly as imposing as coronation, just two years later, while he was out of the country, the French engineered a coup that overthrew him. But what we get from this is this is how we celebrate kings. In just under a month, we're going to celebrate, actually just over a month, we're going to celebrate the coronation of King Charles II, and it's going to be a ceremony full of pomp and circumstance and grandiosity, or pomp and circ yeah, and grandiosity, sorry, words are difficult this morning, um, and grandiosity, because that's what we do as humans. We look to those we place our hope in, and we celebrate them in, in extravagant and lavish ways, and we're drawn to that. 
something humans have been doing for a really long time. Look at this next picture. This is a Roman triumphal arch. Throughout history, from the Persians to the Egyptians to the Romans, the arrival of a new king or a conquering hero has been celebrated in some significant way. Today, around the former Roman Empire, you'll find these triumphal arches in everywhere from uh, Israel and Palestine, the Middle East, up through Turkey and to Greece and in Spain and Rome and North Africa. And these herald the conquering generals, the, the greatness of what they had done and they had accomplished. And, and if you did something really special, you got to ride through Rome and have a, a triumphant procession. So Rome kind of gave us this idea of what this could look like. And you march, through, uh, you march through Rome, and, and the Roman general would ride in a chariot above all the men, and people would be shouting and celebrating, and behind him would be a servant whispering in his ear, remember, you are but just a man. Even in Rome, they thought that this could get to your head, that there was something that this grandiosity, this celebration could be more than it should have been, and Rome tried to humble, keep them humble unsuccessfully. Well, we're not much different, are we? We can look back on, on Rome, we can look back in 1970s, nearly 50 years ago, on Africa, and we're not that much different. If you think of our national elections of the last 20 years, you think of the pomp and the circumstance. Think of the celebratory nights on election night, and, and everybody's got their convention center, and it's ready to go off in cannons and parades, right? We are prone to celebrate where we place our hope, and we are prone to put our hope in men. In today's passage, we're going to see that the people put their hope in Christ. And you might think, yes, that's exactly what they're supposed to be doing. But unfortunately, we're going to see them putting their hope in a Christ of their imagination rather than the Christ that was right before them. Again, something we're incredibly prone to do. We're not careful. It doesn't take long for us to follow our culture into the social justice Jesus, the patriot Jesus, the Jesus who loves and affirms everything that we do. And what we're going to see is the crowds in Jerusalem that day celebrated a king who thought they would get, he would give them exactly what they wanted. If we're not careful, we will find ourselves going that direction. We can, without too much effort, find ourselves chasing the king we want rather than the king we need. Well, we'll be in John's Gospel this week, and so I want to give you some background on John's Gospel so you understand what John is doing. It's a very intentional Gospel, and it's a very powerful Gospel. As one commentator put it this week, it is paradoxically the most accessible and yet the most complex of the four Gospels. It's the Gospel that we tell new believers, hey, you want to know more about Jesus and how to grow in your faith? Read John's Gospel. But for those of us who have walked with the Lord for a while, it's also the Gospel we come back to time and time again, and we keep mining it for its depths because there's so much here. And my hope this morning is to give you a sense of all that's going on in John's Gospel in just seven verses. It's the place where we find the clearest explanation of the gospel in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever might believe in him might have eternal life or would believe in him. It's also the gospel that's the most explicit about what he's doing. Take a look at John 20 here, 20, 30 through 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Greek word for Messiah, the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. And then John, in very orderly fashion, gives us seven signs and seven I am statements to back up this statement, to show us, to lead us to this point that Jesus is not only the promise, he is also the Son of God, and by believing in him, we find eternal life. What we find in this is that John helps unpack the fact that Jesus, as Messiah, is the fulfillment of the promises we've been talking about. You might remember, oh, maybe six, eight weeks ago, Andy talked about Adam and that seed, right? The God that would crush Satan's head. And we got the promise that God was going to do something coming out of the fall. And then we've talked about Abraham, and we've talked about Isaac, and we've talked about Jacob, and, and we've talked about over the last sort of month, month and a half, that God has a plan and works. That he's made a promise that these people, broken and faulty as they are, will bring a blessing to the nations. And what John is going to do in his gospel is say that promised Messiah that one that God has told us from the very beginning he would send, he's here. And I don't want you to miss it. What we're going to find in John 12 is everybody misses it initially. Everybody misses it, no matter how staged and poised they are to catch it. Well, John isn't interested in just us assenting to these interesting facts. 
John doesn't want us to open John 12 or John, the Gospel of John and treat it like a textbook. Teach me what I need to know for the exam. And I want to show you here in verse 31 why I believe that. But these are written so that you may believe. The Greek word behind believe is pisteo. It, it's not this sort of knowledge belief or this heart belief. It's an active belief. I, I write these things that you might go on believing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and your eternal life. And so John is calling us to an active faith that transforms not only our head and our heart, but our lives. So even today, as we open John 12, might it call us to be changed and transformed. For John, the whole point is that we would believe in an ongoing and active way. Because John's gospel is so rich, and because this is such a special week, I want to invite you to join me and our Cornerstone family this week in walking through the gospel of John. We're going to walk through chapters 12 that we'll look at today, all the way through the resurrection for next Sunday. Now, you'll get an email if you're on our email list after today telling you kind of, hey, we're going to read this chapter today, and we're going to read this chapter, and if it's a really busy day, just meditate on this verse. You can also find it in the Church Center app. Go to more, click on Easter 2023. The reading plan's there, and it's on our website. But what a great week for us to sit with this gospel, say, Jesus, what did you do in this last week of your life that you would want to use in my life that I might more actively believe who you are and what you've done? So I encourage you to join us. Again, you'll get an email this afternoon with those details. All right, well, let's get ready to jump into John 12. Before that, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you for uh, just your, your goodness and your love to us, uh, for us. Thank you for this word. Uh, Lord, I, I'm reminded that throughout the ages, people have tried to destroy your, the Bible, Scripture, to get rid of it. And Lord, not only did you inspire the original, original authors to write it down, but Lord, you've preserved it. That on April 2nd, 2023, we might gather together to open this word, that you might speak through it, that you might open our eyes to what you've done through your son, that you might deepen our understanding of who he is, that we might more actively go on and keep on believing in the great news of the gospel. So Father, I would just pray this morning over these next 30 minutes together, would you do that work in us through your word? It's in your son's name, our Savior, we pray. Amen. All right, well, hopefully you've made your way to John 12. Uh, if not, or if you would like a Bible, we do have Bibles at the back um, desk and along the back walls. Feel free to grab one of those uh, to join us. All right, well, picking up in verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as, as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. What's going on here? We see a donkey. We see Hosanna, whatever that means. We see two Old Testament references. We see the raising of Lazarus mentioned. We see the Pharisees and the crowd and, and a dis group of disciples who don't get it. What's going on? What we're going to do is we're going to unpack this sort of verse by verse if you haven't been here before. I encourage you to leave this passage open in front of you even as we jump back and forth. And, and we're hopefully going to show you how rich this passage is in understanding who Christ was. Well, let's make a first observation. We see three groups in this passage. We see the crowds, we see the disciples, and we see the Pharisees. So we're going to keep them in mind as we walk through these verses, because all three will respond to this situation in different ways. First, though, we pick up with this statement, the next day. The next day after what? Why do we care about the next day? Why does it matter? Well, at the beginning of chapter 12, we're told that Jesus has traveled to Bethany, now, Bethany is a town about two miles away from Jerusalem, and he and his disciples are headed to Jerusalem for Passover. Now, why Bethany? Why they stop there? Well, some of Jesus' best friends live in Bethany, and not just that, the sign of his last miracle. Now, Jesus' friends that live in Bethany are Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And you might know them through the Gospels, right? Mary is the one who's busy, sort of in hospitality, trying to care for everyone. And Jesus says, hey, Mary, there are more important things than being busy about hospitality. 
Martha's the one that will pour oil on Jesus' feet, right? And, and G- Judas will say later on, actually in, in chapter 11, oh man, we should have sold that and given it to the poor because he wanted a little cut of it because he was stealing money from the purse. I've always found that interesting that Jesus had a thief in his disciples. And it was just an interest. Anyways, that's a side note. Sorry, sidetracked. Um, oh, and I just lost my train of thought. Um, so, uh, and then Lazarus. Lazarus is super important here. Lazarus has been raised from the dead. And what's really important, and you can't miss this, is how this changes everything. John 11 gives us the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead, and there are at least two important re- two reasons that this is significant. The first one is it affirmed who Jesus said he was. It underlined that he was indeed the promised Savior, the Messiah. Remember, John's goal is to get us to this point where we see that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, Lazarus' resurrection is the last of those signs. John leaves it for the very last, and he chooses the last one because he thinks it's the most important. I want to show you why it is. The resurrection of Lazarus affirmed what the people hoped the Messiah would do. The raising of Lazarus uh, comes just a few verses after Jesus tells Martha in John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. Martha's just lost her brother. He, he's been dead for four days. And it would seem like, okay, Jesus, those are easy words to say. If you can't raise him from the dead, I don't know why I would believe in you. And, and of course, what happens just a few verses later? Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls found at the caves of Qumran, this ancient Essene te- uh, co- uh, group, con- congregation, uh, who study the word of God, we found this written. The Lord will accomplish glorious things which have never been, for he will heal the wounded and revive the dead and bring good news to the poor. Well, this community who study God's word, at least the Old Testament, closely is echoing the words of Isaiah. In Isaiah 26, 19, we see this. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light and the earth will give birth to the dead. Lazarus' resurrection is so important because by the time it happens, the people are primed for this being one of the key signs of the Messiah. The people are looking at it and said, he's doing the thing we've hoped the Messiah would do. He's doing the thing that was promised the Messiah would do. He has to be the Messiah, the promised one from old. And as a result, the second reason this is important is this leads to Jesus' popularity. Not only those who watched him call Lazarus out from the grave, but the people they've told. And as we're told at the beginning of verse 12 in John 12, the crowd comes out to meet him because they've heard of this resurrection. The fact that a man who had been dead for four days is up and walking around is a difficult thing to ignore. Right? You look at Jesus' other signs, and you say, well, it didn't really happen. It didn't really happen the way you had it. But there were a ton of people who saw Lazarus walk out of that grave. And those people are spreading the word. You don't get to ignore that one. So look at verses 10, 11, and John 12, right before our section for today. Here's what we're told. The chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. I don't know about you, but this is one of those verses I, I've missed over the years somehow, that Lazarus' resurrection, even before Jesus' resurrection, led to him being put on the most wanted list. And he joins Jesus there. Because by the time we get here in chapter 12, both Jesus and Lazarus now are in the eyes of the Pharisees, men who should be killed. Because they're leading their, their people astray. And we'll talk about why that's so important here in a little bit. So when Jesus' entry into Jerusalem takes place, it's, it's in the, the context of this excited crowd. The Messiah has come. The promises are fulfilled. One has been raised from the dead. Might he be the one we've hoped for? The crowd is at a fever pitch, and as we know all too well, a fever pitch mob will be a fickle mob. Because it will be not a week later that they cry out, crucify him. The one that they had celebrated on this day, they will call for his death just a few days later. Well, the fickleness of a crowd at fever pitch is something we actually know all too well, sadly. Whether it's every election cycle or it's the violence of the summer of 2021, we know both the power of the crowd and the ability of a crowd to turn on a dime. When things don't go the way they want, when there's something they want to chase after, the crowd becomes a very difficult thing to wield. Well, this fever pitch fickle mob is in Jerusalem for a feast. It's the Passover feast, and as Josephus will tell us, it brings over two million people into Jerusalem every year. 
That's a ton of people for a small town. Now, let me give you some context. Fort Bend County has under a million people. So double the population of Fort Bend County and put it in Rosenberg and probably a place smaller than Rosenberg. It's a ton of people who are in Jerusalem. It's so many people that Rome actually reinforces their garrisons in Jerusalem every year because they don't know what might happen. And if that mob gets out of control, they will lose the city. And they know it. So much so that not only does Rome reinforce the garrisons, Rome actually puts a lot of the weight on the Pharisees. This is one of your festivals. This is one of your religious practices. If the mob gets out of control, it's your fault. And guess who will pay? You will pay. And Rome exacts a high price from those who fail. So let's take into consideration that we often will be very critical on the Pharisees, but a lot is at stake for the Pharisees, as we'll see in a second. They could lose everything, not only their own lives, but the land and the nation, if this gets out of control. So they're incredibly worried about what is happening. The other thing that's important to know about this feast is it's the third of three Passovers John will mention. You're like, ah, that's more detail than we need. It's actually a really significant piece. In John 2, we get the first Passover that John tells us about. Jesus travels up to Jerusalem, and there he cleanses the temple. He actually goes in the temple space where the Pharisees are in control, and it's their space, and he takes authority, and he chases the money lenders out. So he says, well, hold on, you are not doing what you should as religious leaders, and I will come in, and I will take over. So that's what he did back in John 2. So now he's coming back in John 12. There's another reason for the Pharisees to be anxious. Okay, so that's happening. But John also doesn't want us to miss the point about what the people are doing. So the Pharisees are nervous. Last time he was here, he cleansed the temple. In John 6, we get the next Passover. John, Jesus is not in Jerusalem for this one. He's up in Galilee. He's fed the 5,000. And what does John 6 tell us? They want to make him king. And so kind of excited is the crowd that this is going to be our next king, that Jesus has to slip away from the crowd, lest they actually do it. So when we get to John 12 and Jesus is headed to Jerusalem at a Passover feast, those two feasts are in the mind of the readers and the mind of the people. Jesus threatened the Pharisees in the first one, and he was almost made king by the people in the second one. So when we get to 12, both those pieces are still at play. And so we, we shouldn't miss the fact, I think oftentimes I've seen the triumphal entry sort of minimized. Ah, eh, the people didn't really want to make him king. They just thought he was a really great teacher. John doesn't give us that room. John makes it very clear. Here is the Messiah who's filling the promises. We're going to call him the king of Israel because we want him to be king. And guess what? Last time we tried to make him king. Here's our chance. So let's not miss the point that the people really want Jesus to be a king that will liberate them from the Romans. Let's talk really quickly about the Passover feast and what that is. It remembers an event in Egypt. If you, if you know your Old Testament, you're familiar with this. But the Passover feast was commanded by God in the Old Testament, and it reflected back on people's liberation from Egypt. You might remember the last of the ten, um, ten plagues is that the angel of death will pass over Egypt and it will kill all the firstborns. And the people of God are commanded to, to sacrifice a lamb and then spread that lamb's blood over their door. And if they'll do that, their, their family will be passed over. They will not be killed where everybody else will. And so in a night where you hear wailing across Egypt, your family is safe, not because of any righteousness you've done, but because a lamb died for your family and you spread its blood over your door. And that's what this Passover feast commemorates. It commemorates that God had passed over his people, protected them. And so here we're going to see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey He's going to be heralded as a liberating king, and the people don't realize it's not a king that rides into town, it is a sacrificial lamb that rides into town. The last, the final lamb to be slain to save the entire world, as we'll see. Well, the crowd is in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. They're excited that this Messiah who's raised Lazarus from the dead is there, and they come out to meet him. And so let's take a look at verses 13 through 15. When the people uh, meet Jesus, John tells us this. They took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Well, if you didn't know, this is where we get the name for today, Palm Sunday, um, from the people waving branches and reciting the psalm. A couple of things really important here. The psalm they're reciting is from what we call the Egyptian Hallel. 
It's five psalms, Psalm 113 through 118, that the people would sing together as they marched up to Jerusalem throughout the year. Anytime they were going to Jerusalem, whether it's for Passover or the Feast of Tabernacles, they would sing these songs among the group that was traveling. And so when the crowd meets Jesus on this day, they sing a song they've just been singing. And if you look at Psalm 118, the focus of Psalm 118 is God save us. God send a Savior. God redeem us. God, you are our cornerstone. Help us. And so the Messiah that they've heard about who's just raised Lazarus is riding into t- to Jerusalem. And what's the word on their mouth? It's the psalm they've been singing as they came to Jerusalem, that Passover feast. And in Psalm 118, we're, we're told this, verses 25 through 26. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. This is the song they had been singing. Save us, we pray, Hosanna. I don't know about you, but growing up in the church, Hosanna always felt like a worshipful word. Oh, magnificent are you, great and glorious are you, God, Hosanna. But no, for this group, it was a cry of help. Hosanna, save us, we pray. Life is difficult. We don't want to be here. Save us. And that's what the people are crying out. They're not worshiping a king who's coming, though maybe they are an element. They're actually crying out that he might be the savior they're hoping for. Now, the great thing for us is Hosanna does become a worshipful word for us because the one who saved us did ride into Jerusalem that day. And we do get to declare that we have already been saved in Hosanna. Hosanna, king of Israel. John doesn't let us miss the point. This was supposed to be a king who would conquer, a king who would liberate. Context is everything, and, and our, our, our stories are everything. And for the people that day, they were re, reliving, uh, maybe that's the word, a story they had been told by their grandfathers. You see, a hundred years earlier, a conquering Jewish leader had ridden into Jerusalem, and they had done the exact same thing. Uh, they'd sung Psalm 118 to them. They'd waved palm branches when one of Maccabee's sons had ridden into Jerusalem to celebrate the toppling of the Seleucid Empire. It was Jerusalem liberated from the Seleucids. And it's actually at that point that palm branches start showing up on the coins of the the Jewish people. It's at that point that they start looking for a similar conquering Messiah in a a really distinct way. And so when Jesus rides in, here is the next Maccabees. Here is the guy we can wave palm branches for and sing Psalm 118 because he's going to be like the last guy 100 years ago. John gives us point after point after point. Don't miss this. They were hoping for a conquering king. Well, in a really sort of amazing, understated way, Jesus doesn't try to argue with them. He doesn't try to stop and say, wait, you got it wrong. He shows them that they're wrong. Because he rides into Jerusalem that day, not on a war horse, but on a donkey. Yes, Jesus will come one day, as John will tell us in Revelation 19, on a white war horse, a conquering king to bring justice and righteousness. That is not this day. On this day, he rides in a donkey, a symbol of nobility, a symbol of peace. It was the chosen seed of the prophets of old, and it was a sign of humility. You can almost hear the people shouting, you know, great is he, save us, Hosanna! Huh? Huh? Why are you on a donkey? Like, that's not the way this is supposed to go. And there's almost this pause. What is going on? And Jesus hasn't said a word. He's just ridden in on a donkey. And one of the things that's really beautiful here is that we get a a point to Zechariah 9. Jesus is following his father, regardless of what's going on around him. And he's bringing to fulfillment, just as it is written, that this would happen. Zechariah 9 is a really interesting passage. It proclaims a king who would come on a donkey, not a war horse. A king who would come not to bring revolution, but to bring peace. A king who would come to sort of do away with warfare and conflict, not to bring it. And as we're told, the disciples won't understand that connection till later. But Jesus is living out the prophecies of God. Maybe you know this already, but Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament. What's amazing to me about that is one or two, okay, well, those are happenstance. 300, over 300, he fulfilled to the letter. It's like God God said, here is my son. He will faithfully walk in my way in such a way that you can't miss him. Jim Scherzinski shared with me this morning that, that one of those prophecies prophesied when Jesus would come. 
And if you want, catch Jim or catch me, and I'd love to share that research with you. But what's pretty amazing is that Jesus doesn't enter Jerusalem on a donkey in the right decade, and the right year, or the right month. No, it's the right day that prophecy said. It is almost as if God's saying, I am in control of everything regardless of what you do. And and church, we've seen that, right? We've seen that with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and God's still showing us that in Christ. He is in control. And so, just as it was said in Zechariah, Jesus marches, or walks, <laughs> rides in to Jerusalem on a donkey. Well, indeed, the crowd wasn't the only one to kind of maybe say, huh, that's weird. We get in verse 16, let's take a look. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. One of the things I love about John's gospel is we get this comment throughout it. They didn't get it. I don't know about you. I've been walking with the Lord for over 30 years, and there's things I'm still wrestling to get my head around. I just sometimes feel like I don't get it. And and I love that the gospel of John says, yeah, neither did Jesus' disciples. They got three years with him. And and John, who's writing this book, one of his closest, is honest enough to acknowledge, yeah, we didn't get it. it. It didn't make sense to us either. But then John also says, hey, we did get it eventually. Which leads us to John 14, which we don't have time to dive into today, but you can read this week with us, where Jesus says, hey, I know you don't get it all, but guess what? I'm going to send a help. I'm going to send a Holy Spirit. Look at John 14, 26. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. They didn't get it. Neither do we at times. But guess what? Jesus sent a Holy Spirit to them. And guess what happens for us when we accept Christ as our Savior? God puts his Holy Spirit in us. And that Holy Spirit's patient with us. No, we don't wake up the next morning and open the Bible and understand everything. Ask any believer in this room who's been walking with the Lord for a while, and they'll say, yeah, there's still things I'm wrestling with, trying to get my head around. It's actually a way that God keeps us humble. But God does give us his Holy Spirit that we might understand. And so John, writing this, said, hey, we didn't get it then. Now we do. And let me show you what God's doing in Jesus entering Jerusalem on a donkey. Joe Painter is really good to keep me humble in lots of ways. And Monday at the preaching team meeting, uh, we were talking about the fact that they didn't get it. And he must have said four or five times in our conversation, yeah, they're just like us. I think sometimes we can be a little hard on the disciples and say, why didn't you get it? Like, we can get it. Why didn't you get it? And Joe's so good to say, no, 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 we don't get it either. How many times in our life has God tried to teach us something or show us something and we just didn't get it? And so let's not be too hard on the the disciples. Let's be grateful for the Holy Spirit, but let's recognize that they don't get it just like us. Well, this week, as you find yourself struggling in reading God's Word or or struggling in the season of life God's got you in and saying, God, I don't get it. I know you're good, but I don't see you being good right now. God, I'm praying for this and you're not bringing it. Or or God, you're doing something in my family and it's really hard and painful. Or, Or God, I'm opening up your Word and you say this, I just don't understand. There's hope church for us that there is a god who will help us see eventually there is a god who puts his holy spirit in us and says if you will walk with me faithfully i will show you what i'm doing and this story of the triumphant entry reminds us of that let's take a look at uh, the second half of our passage for today john 12 16 through 18 his disciples did not understand these things at first but when jesus was glorified then they remember that these things had been written about him and had been done to him verse 17 The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. Well, as John wraps up this section, this portion of his narrative, we get three groups. The three groups I mentioned at the beginning of today. The disciples, the crowd, both those who saw the resurrection of Lazarus, actually witnessed it and told everybody else about it, and the crowd in Jerusalem, excited to meet the Messiah who's coming. And we get the Pharisees, who have been looking for a way to kill Jesus. So let's take a look at the Pharisees now as we wrap up. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. I don't know about you, but I I read this verse. I'm like, that kind of feels weird. Like, it's just kind of out of nowhere. Like, the whole world is going after him. What's the deal here? So there's two things we want to understand. One, that this is coming out of a conversation from John 11. So we're going to look at bits of that in a second. The other thing I want us to catch is the word world here. And we'll unpack why that's significant in a second as well. Well, back in chapter 11, Lazarus has been raised from the dead. The people are so excited that the Messiah is here. And the Pharisees get together and they say, what are we going to do about this? 
This is not going the way we had hoped. And here's the conversation they have. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered around the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Don't miss the stakes for the Pharisees. Everything was at stake for them if Jesus continued to grow in popularity. What are they to do with Jesus? If his following continues to grow, they're going to lose their positions of authority, possibly their land, possibly their lives. It's no small thing. And so in verse 50, right after this, Caiaphas, the high priest, who we'll see later on at the trial of Jesus, says this, Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Of course, in that moment, Caiaphas is saying, hey, let's kill him, try to squash this, otherwise we're going to lose everything to Rome. But what John and his goodness shows us in verses 51 through 52 is that Caiaphas was saying a truth he didn't realize he was saying. Verse 51 He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Which leads us back to the word world, or cosmos, in verse 19. Look, the world is going after him. Indeed, with those two million people in Jerusalem, with the crowds coming from Bethany, it must have felt like the entire world was going after Jesus. It must have felt like to the Pharisees they were losing control of the entire situation. That the world was going after him. But when I read that, I I can't help but think of John 3, 16. Jesus didn't come that the world would chase him as a conquering hero. Jesus came to give his life for the world. For God so loved this world that's chasing after him that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Church, what an incredible thing that our God is not looking for a mob to follow him. Our God is looking for a world that he's willing to die for. That God would give his one and only son in order that we might have eternal life. This is the glorious news of this Easter week. It is not just another thing that's happened in history. It is the proclamation of a God who says, I love you in the midst of your misunderstandings. I love you in the midst of your mob mentalities and the things that you look at for your own good. I love you so much that I would send my son to die to free you, not from Rome, but from your own sin. Jesus didn't come to give them the political freedom they clamored for. He came to give them eternal freedom and life. And it wouldn't just be for them, it'd be for the entire world. And let's not miss who that includes. That includes the crowd that celebrated him as king, the crowd that would five days later say, crucify him, he came to die for them. It also includes the disciples who had been traveling with him and ministering with him, and they don't get it. He came to die for them. It also includes the Pharisees, the very ones who will orchestrate his death, he came to die for them. So I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you have people in your life like I do who say, God could never love me. Like, I, I've messed up so much. I have so much baggage. I keep doing this. The story of the triumphal entry and the story of this week is, no, there is nothing you can do that Christ didn't die for you. That his great love doesn't overcome, doesn't wipe away, doesn't wash away the things you've done. So even as the Pharisees lament that the world is going after Jesus, Jesus is coming after the world. Not in vengeance, not in wrath, but in love, laying down his life for them. The story of the gospel is an incredible, amazing thing. It truly is awesome. God's love for us. The people hoped Jesus was going to be their political liberator. The disciples didn't get what he was doing. The Pharisees saw him as a threat. Truth is, all three groups missed him. They missed what he was doing. They didn't get it. The crowd celebrated the arriving Savior with palm branches and shouts of, Save us, Hosanna! Much like a desire we have to celebrate the grandiosity of a king at coronation or the triumphal march of a, of a general who's been successful. That's what we do as humans. The crowd on that first Palm Sunday hoped Jesus would be their conquering king, but King Jesus had something way more important for them. By the end of the week, they would be disappointed and they would call for his death. So here's a challenge for us today. Is there some expectation you're putting on Jesus 
And if he doesn't meet that expectation, you're going to be disappointed. And to the extent where maybe you don't call for his crucifixion, but you would walk away from him. Jesus, if you don't do this thing for me, then you can't be my savior. Or you can't be the one I hope for because you didn't do this thing that I hoped you would do. I think the word of the triumphal entry for us is Jesus isn't actually worried about what we want him to do. He's more worried about the thing he's do, done for us because it's way more important. So let's not lose sight of the fact that it's not about Jesus being the king we want. He's the king we need. Well, for the disciples, they didn't understand what Jesus was doing fully. And maybe you're in a place in your walk with the Lord where you don't quite get it or you're really struggling with, God, I don't understand. I don't know why you're letting me go through these seasons of, of difficulty and uncertainty in life. And like the disciples, I think God's saying to you, hold fast to what you do know. Remember that I'm a God who is at work moving through every situation to bring my promised plan. I'm a God who, who sent you the Holy Spirit that you might understand more fully as time goes on what I'm doing in your life. Will you trust me even if you don't understand? Well, for the Pharisees, they dug in their heels that Jesus was absolutely not going to be the Messiah. There was no way, matter how many signs and promises and prophecies he fulfilled, this was not the guy. I'm going to ask us, is there an area in our walk with the Lord, our relationship with Jesus, where we've dug our heels in? Where he said, absolutely no way. The only thing that could be right is the way I see it. Maybe it's, it, it, you've dug in your heels and Jesus is only Jesus if he's this kind of Jesus. I mean, in our very town in Houston, there, we have those things being proclaimed from pulpits. Jesus is this kind of Jesus, and he can't be anything else. But maybe there's an area in your life where you've dug in your heels in an area of theology or an area of what church life should look like, and you've dug in your heels like the Pharisees. And you're not willing to say, God, what might you be doing that I'm missing? What might you be doing that, that I don't want to see because it means I have to move from my position? There's great encouragement for us in Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee among this community that dug their heels in. And you know what Nicodemus did? He went to Jesus at night and said, what's going on? It was to Nicodemus we got John 3.16. Nicodemus then will speak up for Jesus in a council to the point at which they will scoff at him and say, are you one of his followers? It will be Nicodemus who after the resurrection, or after Jesus' death, will bring anointing oil to anoint him. If you find yourself in a place where your heels are dug in, you don't have to stay there. Nicodemus did not have to be like the rest of the Pharisees. He chose to investigate and see what Jesus was doing. I want to encourage you. Is there some way that you need to let go of? Is there something that you need to let go of to confess the pride that got you to that place where you dug your heels in and then just trust the Lord and follow him? Well, regardless of where you find yourself, there's great news for us today. Whether you're the crowd who misunderstood Jesus, you're the disciples who didn't get Jesus, or the Pharisees who dug their heels and said, no way, this could be Jesus, that doesn't change anything, actually. It doesn't change what Jesus came to do. It doesn't change what God did on the cross and wants to do for us. He's inviting us into the great news of the gospel. So as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, celebrated as what people hoped would be a saving, conquering king, he was, in fact, the servant king, who by the very end of that very week would be the final Passover lamb. The sacrificial lamb who would be crucified for the fickle crowd, the uncertain disciples, and the fearful Pharisees. His disciples will be scattered. They'll be disheartened that their leader, their Lord, and their Savior has died. And as we look at next week of the resurrection, everything changes when he's risen, to de when he's risen from the dead. And they become not uncertain, scared, fearful disciples, but men and women who will lay down their life for this man. Well, Jesus knew clearly where he was headed on that Easter Sunday. He was riding into Jerusalem to bring freedom, not from Rome, but from slavery to sin. He was riding in Jerusalem to bring hope to the hopeless. He was riding in Jerusalem to bring new life to the walking dead through his death on the cross. He was the final Passover lamb who would take away the sins of the world. For whoever believed in him might have eternal life. Well, this morning we get the encouragement